we hail. Hello from Hollywood. This is C.P. McGregor speaking and welcoming you to another performance of your War Department program, Proudly We Hail. Through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, we present the brilliant actress, Miss Nancy Coleman, as the star of our play, The Shadow Gives Light, music by Eddie Scrivanik. The neighbors pointed to the Crothers' house often and admirably. And they spoke of the lovely young Ann Crothers and her Aunt Julie, and of the devotion and love between them. But perhaps the neighbors didn't know of the excitement in the Crothers' house on the morning of our story, an excitement displayed in every graceful movement of Ann's as she hurries upstairs with a breakfast tray for her aunt. Aunt Julie, Aunt Julie, come in, my dear. Good morning, my sweet. There. Here's a big kiss. Mm. <laughs> now, breakfast fit for a queen. Oh, thank you, my dear. Mm, coffee smells so good. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you wearing today, my dear? I'm wearing a beautiful blue dress with white polka dots on it. Oh. Oh, it's so nice to hear you so cheerful. But then, my darling, aren't you always? You're the one in this family to take all the bows for being cheerful. Oh, but, Annie, this is the day we've waited for so long. I, I just know Dr. Levering is going to bring us wonderful news. Yes, my dear. Yes. He told me yesterday he'd confer with Dr. Conrad this morning and that he'd be over with a report this afternoon. And when he talked to the operation, he... he sounded so optimistic. Did he? Really? Yes. Oh, Aunt Julie... You're going to see again, I know it. Even though it has been five long years. Five years? It hadn't seemed so to me. You're so cheerful and so patient. Well, my child, I've had you, you know. And then I've learned that... the darkness can hold many beautiful things. Thoughts and memories that seem much sweeter than they ever did before. There's a the phone. Back in the flash. Has Dr. Levering arrived yet? Not yet, Bob. I can't wait. It means so much to Aunt Julie and to me. I'm sure he'll bring us the wonderful news we've been waiting for. Of course he will. But, darling, I, I don't want you to get too excited about this because... Honey, you've got to have faith. Well, then, you also have to be practical. And if We've it... talked about that if very, very completely. I cannot and I will not leave Aunt Julie alone. Darling, I know Aunt Julie wouldn't want you to stay with her if she were to know. Bob, please. Let's wait until Dr. Levering comes, huh? Okay, my sweet. I'll call you the very minute he arrives. Dr. Levering must be conferring with Dr. Conrad now. Think the right thing, my darling. Well, Dr. Conrad, do you have good news for me? First, Dr. Levering, let me tell you that I know how much this particular case means to you. However, the brain trauma is so severe, an operation would be inadvisable. If there's even a good chance, Doctor. There is not even that. Your patient, I'm afraid, Doctor, is incurably blind. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sorry. Well, it's something that I want to know. And I'm sure it's something she would want to know, too. Before continuing our Proudly We Hail story starring Nancy Coleman, we bring you an inspiring message from Mr. Donald B. Tressender, president of Stanford University. Mr. Tressender says... I am pleased that the educational privileges of the G.I. Bill of Rights have been extended to the men who are now enlisting in the armed services. In providing this added inducement to enlist, the Congress has recognized the need to maintain a strong military force on a voluntary basis. A large response on the part of our young men 
will do much to demonstrate that a free people can maintain the strength necessary for full defense in terms of modern weapons of warfare. Equally important is the fact that the opportunities now offered through the GI Bill make it possible for men with necessary qualifications, regardless of their financial means, to acquire a broad and general education as well as training in a field of specialization. The bill does not restrict the kind of education a young man is to receive. It gives every man a chance to follow his special bent. In this way, the nation recognizes that through education, there is hope for maintaining peace. And now we continue our play starring Miss Nancy Coleman. It is late afternoon at the Crothers' house. Anne and Aunt Julie are talking. Well, Dr. Levering should be here any minute. Getting anxious? No. No. Uh, is there a window open, my dear? I feel a draft. I'll get you a wrap. Here, put this around your shoulders. Thank you. Why, Aunt Julie, you're trembling. I was just <laughs> thinking that they can only do so much. Aunt Julie, please. No, no, my dear. You are young and lovely and excitable, and that's good. But in any event, you must know one thing. The darkness is a very beautiful place in which to live one's memories. Actually, were I never to see again, I can think of but one regret I might have. I should regret very much not being able to see what a beautiful bride you will be when you go to the altar with Robert. You're sweet. Aunt Julie? Yes, my dear? We never did kid each other, did we? No, not that I can remember. And you know that I'd never leave you when you need me. You're thinking of Bob, aren't you? Have you told him that? Bob knows how I feel. I'm sorry we haven't spoken of this before. Perhaps we were both pinning too many hopes on Dr. Levering and Dr. Conrad. My dear, your life, yours and Bob's, belongs to you. You must promise me that you will never forget that. Sorry, I just can't go along on that. Bob wants you to marry him, doesn't he? Yes. And he wants your home to be your home, doesn't he? My dear, I want to tell you something I've never told you. Thirty years ago, a certain young man, well, suppose we call him David, that was his name, asked to end our engagement, which had continued much too long, and to marry him at once while he completed his studies. Because of certain responsibilities to my family, I refused. I would say he was very selfish. No, no, he wasn't, dear. If ever there was a time when he needed me, it was when he was making his plans for the future. A future that we were to share. But if he really loved you, he should have been willing to wait until he'd made a place for himself in the world and a home for you. That was exactly the selfish view I took of it. I didn't realize until after he'd gone how much I... I really loved him. And then it was too late. Why? Because in his loneliness, he met another girl who was willing to brave a few uncertainties and work with him. I read in the papers a few years later where he'd lost her. I prayed for his happiness. Then you still love him? I've never ceased loving him. But it was not until this... this darkness came to me that I was able to look into my heart and read the truth. Aunt Julie, I... I never realized you've known so much unhappiness. Well, it's been no easy task to hide it all these years. A task that I don't want you to face, my dear. So if you follow the advice of one who knows, you will call Robert this very instant and tell him you'll go to the end of the earth with him, if necessary. It'll all work out, Aunt Julie. I know it will. Hello, Anne. Hello, Dr. Levering. Come in. 
I wish I knew a prescription that would put the same kind of roses in the cheeks of some of my patients that you have in yours, young lady. I could tell you what it is, but I'm afraid your patients would have to find the ingredients themselves. <laughs> and how are you, Miss Belden? Exceptionally well at the moment, Doctor. Please, Dr. Levering, tell us. Don't keep us in suspense. Tell you? Yes. What is the verdict? Oh, the verdict is this. But if your Aunt Julie will accept my advice, I will have her seeing out of brand new eyes in a very short time. Oh. Doctor, you really mean it? Young lady, I'm not in the habit of having my veracity questioned. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm so happy I could kiss you. I think I could take it. Oh, you darling. <laughs> <laughs> See, here, you've got my patient blushing. Or is it fever? Not a dangerous one, Doctor. Andy. Uh... Don't keep Bob waiting. Oh, Bob. Oh, that, that's right. I've got to make a phone call, Doctor. The most wonderful phone call in all the world. Then it... It is wonderful news you bring. Dr. Conrad says an operation is impossible. But a moment ago you said... I said I would have you seeing through a brand new pair of eyes in a very short time, and I meant it. From today on... Will you look at life through my eyes, Julie? Will you? Oh, yes, David. Yes. And there's the final curtain on The Shadow Gives Light, starring Miss Nancy Coleman. And now... General Jacob L. Devers, Commanding General of the United States Army Ground Forces, has a message of vital importance for all of us. General Devers. Since the day of her birth, America has been a peace-loving nation. Loving peace, she has paid hardly more than lip service to preparation for war. Twice within the living experience of most Americans, aggressive powers have demonstrated that peaceful intent alone will not suppress war. Today, the United Nations are met together, resolved to settle the disputes of all nations, large and small, peacefully, in the interests of all. The success or failure of the United Nations depends on more than just the promise of the member nations to abide by decisions made by, at the council table. To a good measure, this success or failure will be reflected in the United Nations' ability to make their decisions stick. The United States has pledged its strength to ensure that decisions once derived at are respected and obeyed. In Europe and in the Pacific, millions of people are learning again that the horrors of war do not end with unconditional surrender, that their recovery may be certain, and keeping with democratic principles, we have committed ourselves to a long period of occupation. At the same time, we must man the far-flung garrisons essential to a watchful, vigilant nation. The role of guardian of our own shores is not lessened by our newly acquired responsibilities. These are the responsibilities of your country. They are the responsibilities which come with being the world's greatest nation. We must so fit ourselves that we will not be found wanting in the accomplishment of any one of them. Said simply, this nation must remain strong. We must assure ourselves that World War II, with its Pearl Harbors, Anzios, Normandies, and Tarawas will be read about and not reacted by our sons and the sons to follow. To ensure that, we must have a strong army. To rebuild America's army successfully, we must have the wholehearted support of public opinion and the active interest of every citizen. Thank you, General Devers. And our thanks also to Miss Nancy Coleman and Mr. Donald Tresseter for appearing on this program. Proudly we hail will come to you again over this station next week. Listen in.